Yeah, yeah we just said, well, you bought the left, so I got Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, but there's some money. Okay, not credit for me. the uh, Eugene Symphony Association Board of Directors. And uh, with me tonight is Siri Vick. Uh, she'll be performing for us tomorrow evening at our SimFest concert. Special thanks to our Art Walk, Art Walk sponsor, uh, the Eugene Symphony, and our media sponsor, uh, Eugene Magazine. Uh, the Eugene Symphony, if you don't know, uh, presents SimFest 2 tomorrow at the Hall Center, beginning at 5.30. It includes a concert featuring Time for Three, and Siri Vic, as well as pre- and post-concert events. Uh, sign up with Mariana for your chance to win a pair of tickets. Mariana is... Over here! Okay, she's back here holding a big bowl, and uh, uh, there will be a, uh, a couple of more drawings tonight, although I don't think there's one at this, uh, at this site. Uh, I also will mention something about Arts Alive. If you love dance, right now in Kesey Square, and we could see them down the street. Uh, Arts Alive is taking participants on a journey through time featuring Baroque to modern dance and music and will culminate in a community dance with Jerry Rempel Jazz Syndicate. And now I'm going to hand it over to Siri Vick for artist interviews. Hi everybody. I am here with Mir Pearlson, architect and artist. Mike Hopper, artist. And Roger Ota, Roger Ota, thank you, part of the team that has transformed Timbers Hotel. Now, first question I want to ask you, Mir, is Timbers is kind of an institution in our community. It's been here since the 1950s. It definitely had that 50s feel. Can you tell us about how this process began of transforming the space, but it looks really like with a nod to its history? Thanks, great question. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit and then I'm going to pass it on to Roger because he really, Roger was the one who kind of really led and held everything together. But I, I will say that um, that was a very important piece of, um, you know, things that we don't like about the past and things that we do like about the past when the owners came to us and they really, that was a, a, a big part of the process. How do we determine which parts go, which parts stay, and I can pass it on? Yeah, uh, so we wanted to uh, work with the owners to maintain the spirit of the, the original building and, um, and and at the same time give them more space and update a lot of finishes and fixtures and make the building more appealing visually but also more functional and we really tried to stay within the spirit of the kind of mid-century building that it is but with with kind of a modern flair and um, you know what we didn't see it as a historical preservation project but we also didn't want to come in and make really invasive um, incongruous kind of moves so these are the results and it was a great collaborative project so many people involved everyone in our office the, the owners um, brought so many you know inspiring ideas and just like any project uh, it, it's an amazing collaboration the contractor and all of his um, subcontractors and his team were just, just amazing. Um, Paul Allen, he's here. And uh, it was a lot of fun. 
So, so hopefully this is the, the new Timbers Inn. It's going to be a, an exciting place um, for people from out of town to, to see it, and a kind of a new remade fixture in our in our downtown. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I also, yes, let's reintroduce Mike Hopper. So we are looking at an exhibit of yours, which includes art, design, graphic design, industrial design. It, it's it's so diverse and so yeah, a little bit of everything. That's right. I would love to know how you how you pulled the exhibit together, how you chose everything, and just a little bit about you. It seems like you're very well traveled, very have an interesting experience. Um, so the work starts over here in the corner. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and that that is uh, sketches and inspired by travel. Um, and then the stuff that's on this side is illustration work um, as well as design work. And as Roger mentioned, you know, these all take, it's all collaborative. So there's teams involved in all this stuff. So even though you see uh, you know, I can say, okay, this is some of my work over here. You know, for instance, these panels on this side, um, Nir and I worked on that uh, together, and you know, it was a lot of fun and uh, a real loose concept stuff. Um, you know, this one was with Studio E Architecture. Uh, this one was with an exhibit company. So, so you know, there's a lot of other people involved in, in these designs. Anything else? Well, let's open it up. Let's open it up. Oh, yes, a question. Uh, first question. Uh, did you have, like, a, would it be like a contract with Cafe Young or their owners? Did oh, you do uh, the, I'm uh, noticing this, this one. Now this, okay. So this was, this, this is um, renderings of two options, two design options for uh, tenant spaces at uh, Portland International Airport. And the top one is, was pretty much how it, how it was built, if you ever walked through the concourse. Um, and the design work was on um, this project was done by um, Veronica Sheen, and and I just did the illustration on it. I have worked with Cafe Young and did do a project up in Wilsonville, but which was a first standalone uh, restaurant project that was uh, turned out really nice. So I'm proud of that one. Uh, so. You all, do you have any, any quite Yeah, I see a question already in the back. Who did the concrete work? Oh, great. <laughs> great question. The concrete. Uh, the concrete was done, uh, we have a, a, the, a general contractor, Paul Allen, is here, and he has a, an amazing team of dedicated, insanely meticulous craftspeople. And, and the concrete is, is a testament. And that's um, Ken Wages is the guy's name, and his company is Green Gables. And uh, you can look out, look outside. These these planters are basically a, a work of art. Each piece, and and really everything that was installed here was done with just incredible care. Um, and yeah, Jeff Hatton. Actually, there's another concrete guy for the the counter top uh, at the reception was done by Jeff Hatton. So Jeff Hatton and Ken Wages. Any other questions for you all? Yeah. Let's talk. Did we talk about the countertops? Just mention. Just mention. Let's just. Wait, this one right here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The sparkly one. Oh, oh the sparkly one are actually uh, quartz. It's a quartz, quartz? material. Okay. Um, the finishes here did take a while to pick. Um, there was. It was very clear that there there had to be really a lot of care. There's going to be a lot of care put into all the finishes. Um, and we, we kept kind of assembling uh, a list of ideas, you know. Uh, so the quartz became kind of a, a, a piece that will, will become this, this dark, sparkly, kind of classy material that carries all the way from the bar over there, all the way through here. Um, the wood, the fur, these are all fur panels. The doors are all just Douglas, Douglas fur. And we continue the panels around the lobby on the wall. Um, this is, you can see some reclaimed wood boards on this kind of accent wall and, and the front of the reception counter. So 
the finishes def definitely took a while to figure out. We, we knew we wanted something that's classy, but also very warm and up to a sphere. That's got dog fur. Dog fur on, on all the trees. Uh, yes. um, anyone else? With, I have a question for Michael. Um, how did you get started as an illustrator? I recall actually moving to Eugene and taking an LCC class to learn how to draw. And that went nowhere. I'm curious. <laughs> okay, well, it, it's it's interesting. I've always been interested in, in art and design, and um, I used to do a lot of painting, and I've taken painting classes. And um, my parents encouraged me to uh, not do fine arts, uh, to to do something commercial. And so I took um, some graphic communications out at LCC. And um, then, you know, as a designer, we found that we have to visualize and show our designs to clients. And um, since I already had an aptitude for that, uh, you know, that's kind of where I started to go, was doing a lot of, uh, a lot of presentation work, a lot of perspectives and, and rendering work. And then I decided when I started my own company that that would be something that I would focus on. And, and just you know, kept working on that and getting stronger. And honestly, with everything with the computers and the YouTube and everything now, you can learn to do almost anything. <laughs> you know, so uh, if there's something that I didn't know how to do, I'd look it up and I'd practice and I'd do it. And um, that's pretty much the story. <laughs> yeah, so. All right. And I understand your firm here is really interested in sustainability. Uh, did that come into play here on this project? That's a really good question. Hello? Yeah, yeah um, we definitely upgraded the, the building from an energy standpoint as well as um, making it more comfortable, hopefully. It's pretty crowded right now, so we're testing it. <laughs> but, um, you know, energy efficient, mechanical systems, um, some of the lighting. Definitely this, this whole envelope of uh, roof and walls um, improved insulation and tighter construction. So um, that, that, that should definitely be realized in the, in the bottom line and in the kind of performance of the building. The, the, the specifically on the mechanical system, specifically have a very high efficiency. There's a split, mini split system. You can see this unit here, which is kind of a residential style. Uh, but these are really high efficiency. And then we have these little vents that you can see everywhere. They just circulate air and re re replace the stale air, uh, but they actually ex there's an exchange of the air that moves out. Um, um, the air that comes in takes on whatever temperature of the air that moves out. And it's called an HRV or a heat, heat recovery ventilator. And it's something we've been incorporating into a lot of um, a lot of projects, so it's a it's it's a system that runs almost all the time, but really really low voltage, and it's very high efficiency. Any other questions for the artists? Um, yes. Did you just you did this area? Did you do any of the rooms also? Did you impact on those? We did not. The owners are in the process. Uh, they're constantly improving right. rooms, and they they go from one room to the other, and by the time they get through all of them, they're, they're ready, it's, you know, it takes years, and then they're ready to start and go back through. So the rooms are really wonderful. They have this uh, decking and beams, and uh, it's really hard to build this way now. So they, it's part of the character of this place, and, uh, and they, they buy new furniture that's kind of modern and mid-century and fun. So uh, their website has some of the nicer rooms shown, and uh, we haven't had a lot to do with that, but they do a really nice job updating the rooms. Roger, how long did this project take you? Oh boy, she asked how long this project took. Uh, I see a couple other people that have, been, that have worked on it as well, and it started, um, when did they first come to us? About a, almost two years ago. Yeah, it was almost two years. And it, it just takes a long time to plan something that's this invasive to the building. There's nothing left in, in inside that, that was there before, except uh, maybe five feet of a wall back there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, just the planning and, and then the construction and, um, you know, detailing and structural, all the integration of, of everyone that's involved. And, and, of course, the finishes and the final look, too, but even beyond that, it's just a 
very intensive, time-intensive project. Question for you. Where, where was the original uh, line of the building? And this is all off out right here. Yeah, the original line of the building was, was along there. This beam, basically. So this is a really deep porch where we're standing right now. And we left, we left the ends to be porches. This one's the entry porch, we, we call it. And, and this is sort of a back patio where people can relax outside and have a drink. And I think there's going to be a TV out there and those nice benches. Uh, and then we also filled in that, that corner. I don't know if anyone remembers. That was a porch as well that wasn't being used, really. So, um, so kind of two expansions and then a full gut of the rest of the building. The ceiling is, is just about the only thing that's original. It, there's insulation above. Uh, we, there was a new roof that went on, so, so yeah, so rigid insulation goes on top of that, and then the middle roof. Uh, we have uh, about five minutes to take questions. You're welcome to talk uh, to the artists and move around. Look at the look at the uh, uh, pictures on the wall and look at the building. Uh, and while you do that, I think. Some of us are going to move on. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. a lot about this art here coming up in just a few. So Modern Gallery, I want to thank Denise. She is the owner, proprietor of this lovely establishment and her can't live without assistant, Carmi. They are pouring the wine back here and uh, it seems to keep flowing and probably will keep flowing all evening. Um, so this is a really uh, special time for me because Lord Lieber is sponsoring this art walk and I love theater. So tonight, um, at Modern Gallery, I get to introduce a very um, lovely lady, and I get to find out more about her as well, because I just actually met her. Her name is Frances Bronette. Many of you may, might think that, oh, Storm, you're pronouncing that wrong, as I often do many words, but it's not Brene, it's Bronette. And she will explain that in just a minute. But she is the, um, the dean of the AAA Art College at the University of Oregon. Did I say that right? Well, I'll fix it. Okay, she'll fix that. <laughs> well, that's what she's for. And, uh, and she's going to uh, tell you a little bit about the art and then some artists, and we'll uh, find out more. So uh, without any further ado, Frances Bronet. Bronet. <laughs> it's really hard to resist, because I'm from Montreal, so it just seems that it would be appropriate that it would be Bronet. But welcome everybody. I'm actually, I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture and Allied Arts. And for those of you who don't know, and I've said this a thousand times, so bear with me. 
Uh, there's architecture, landscape architecture, interior architecture, historic preservation, planning, public policy and management, product design, arts administration, all the fine arts, um, and, uh, and art history. And so it's extraordinary and we have relationships with many other units on the campus. We have cinema studies and digital arts and, um, and ecological design. But tonight, I'm very proud uh, to present to you some of the work that is embedded in this extraordinary store. And you have to figure out what belongs to the students and what was designed by our students and what actually is stuff that's for sale. Now, again, you might want to buy some of the stuff that the students made, and they will negotiate with you. But they have learned a little bit, by the way, after doing this for a couple of years. And I, I do want to thank Denise, who's been extraordinary in thinking of the work that the students are doing in art and applied art as something that could be presented in this magnificent venue. And I, I don't know how many people realize this, but I have friends who come from Italy who think this looks like Spazio Sette in Rome. Um, and I think that's really one of the unique gems of a place, this place in, in Eugene. So let me introduce the, um, one of the faculty members who ran the lighting design studio. At lighting, and this, these luminaires actually work as well as are beautiful. And so your goal is to figure out which ones are by the students and which ones are actually for sale. So Ehab uh, Elziadi, who is right here, is the faculty member in architecture who teaches this extraordinary class. And we have product design, which is taught by John Arndt and Wan He, and I don't know if they're here yet, but they will be. And then I'm going to bring up the two... Um, and then Peter here is one of another product design student. He's going to just briefly talk about um, some of the stools over here. Sure. Hi guys. Um, the other two studios were focused on uh, making these stools. Some you can see down here. Um, this was a class working with metal. Um, and they were based kind of from inspired structures elsewhere. And then the other class, most of which is up here, is working with wood, um, based a little bit more on a biomimicry style of stuff, um, but everything should hold up to 200 pounds, so feel free to sit on everything. <laughs> so come on. <laughs> okay, now, so I was thinking we take the microphone uh, down to each piece and have somebody talk a little bit about the different pieces. Is that? Sure. Does that sound right. good? Okay. So I need a student to tell me about this one. Is anybody here that can describe this? Excellent. And your name? My name is Mary. Yes, so this is called Mouse Nest. And we made this out of um, recycled apple mice. They, um, you know, they're the ones that have like just the one button and no squirrel wheel, so nobody uses them anymore. So we recycled them, took off the clear plastic covers, and put, the in put trace paper on the inside so it filters the light. And we use a fluorescent, uh, compact fluorescent bulb, which is, um, uses a low amount of energy. Um, and the space we're designed for is a conference room in the, at the U of O, and it has, already has really nice daylight, so we wanted to just create a light that would have nice ambient light and would create some nice lighting effects in the room. Excellent. Okay, so Mary will be up here uh, to explain mouse nest, is that right? Yes. <laughs> when you uh, make your way up here. Okay, now I'm going down here to the next light, I believe. Or and we wanted to visualize the music waves in uh, a physical form. So compression waves and specifically, um, and as you can see, the translucent uh, pulse in and out. That's our name, Pulse. So Pulse, and I'll be right here to uh, talk to you about that. All right, so where are we? Do we have another lighting upstairs, right? Okay. All right. Oh, and I've got an artist right here to talk about it. Who's going to talk to me about that? What's your name? Like having a reading light 
and part of our main idea with using the camera was to be able to adjust the light, lighting level. And so the lens is actually a fully working lens. So feel free to play with the aperture and the focus and all. It's uh, fully working. Just be kind of gentle with it. And yeah. Thank you. This is one not to miss, folks. I know there's not a lot of room up here, but uh, as Monty, sorry. As Monty said, that the camera like can be uh, adjusted. You can kind of play with it, experiment, experiment with it, but be gentle. Okay, now we're going on to the stools. Is that right? Okay, the stools. These are the stools made out of wood that I heard can uh, hold up 200 pounds. Who's going to talk to me about those? Uh, Uh, it was inspired by Lamborghini and their extreme angles that everyone would come to recognize. Uh, it's supposed to wake you up in the morning. So when you approach the stool, you'll notice that no matter what angle you approach it, it seems like a certain corner isn't supported. So you're a little sketched out about putting your feet on it. Uh, but they all are supported, it's just the view. Um, so feel free to walk around it and use it, sit on it. Um, but to get a real sense of it, just walk around it and you'll get the extreme uh, inspiration that I get. Excellent, thank you. All right, folks, so now we have one more set of stools to talk about. I'm going to make my way down to the. Draw on your stool. If you didn't hear, there's a stop sign stool down here. It was inspired by a stop sign, and you can put your pencils in there and be all ready to do your homework. Is there anyone here that can talk about the wire stools for us? Hello. Okay. All right. Uh, we use a bent um, rod, and we use a tack welding technique. Um, most of these structures, well, all these structures, but one is able to hold up to 200 pounds. Um, mine actually didn't make the 200 pound cut. It's so tall, but um, then we uh, took it and got power coating. And uh, it, overall, it's uh, a little bit stronger with power coating. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. I have to say thanks and remind you what uh, where they are and how they were all made. So thank you everybody. I know you're on your way, and uh, I want to thank the students of the School of
noches. Good evening, everyone. We're happy to be here. We are Tanticos Andinos. Can you remember? Cantos Andinos. Cantos Andinos. Andean songs. We'll be playing music primarily from the Andes with a few things done uh, from other places that have an Andean twist. So um, the first uh, song that we played was a genre called Chuntunki from Bolivia, made famous by the Tarjas. The tune is um, called Nostalgia. And we are uh, next going to be doing another tune from Los Carcas called Quillero Flores. It's a huainito. So you're always free to stand up and dance. Looks like there's a little bit of spot over there. And uh, we'll keep going. Querida Violeta Parra, nuestra versión y versión yapuesca, existe eso, ¿no? De la paloma ausente. Hay muchas palomas hoy día en nuestro repertorio. Thank you. 
negros son los testigos de los cinco dolores que llevo adentro. Welcome, First Friday Art Walk folks. We're going to start up here with Bob Kiefer. I'd like to first mention a special thanks to our media sponsor, Eugene Magazine, as well as family dentist Dr. Donald R. Dexter Jr. for sponsoring this month's Art Walk. Dr. Dexter continuously supports our local art and artist. Watch for his upcoming community art project, Eugene from Holga with Love, a photo series shot by local business owners and Eugene community members. 
Um, tonight we are with Bob Kiefer, and most of you probably realize he's usually on this side of the microphone. <laughs> so tonight we're, we're, we're role reversing here. Um, Bob, these are beautiful pieces of work. Um, I'm just going to turn it over to you to, or you want me to ask you questions? You want me to ask you a couple questions? Okay, my, I'll do my, well see I was kind of trying to get off. <laughs> Um, so when I'm looking at these, my first thought is actually the process, I would love for you to explain to me um, yeah. how they're pr printed, and then we're, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into you as an artist. So let's, let's talk about process first. Okay, this is um, hand-colored black and white photography, which is a historical process that goes back to the very beginnings of photography in the early 19th century. Practically the second that photography was invented, someone took a black and white picture and added paint. So that was how all color photography was done right up to the beginning of the 20th century and really to the time of Kodachrome in the mid-1930s when you could now reliably take a color picture. The, the process has continued as a kind of nostalgia art form up to this day. So I got interested in the process 20 years ago. I was a black and white photographer with a dark room. I had a big stack of, of practice prints and work prints and sat down one night in front of the TV and started coloring with colored pencils on one and then thought, oh, that's kind of cool looking. And then I got some um, cooking oil and smudged the color in and blended it. And I thought, that's really cool. Um, and it completely transformed the look of the picture and I thought, that would be fun to pursue, and so here I am 20 years later with, with slightly larger versions of that picture. These are shot digitally. Um, digital cameras, by and large, take color images, so I transform these into black and white images on the computer, and then I print them out on a wide format printer on a good quality Stonehenge paper with 100% carbon pigment ink so that they don't have the tendency to fade that at least early digital prints used to have. And I'm still not entirely confident about Epson colorings today. Um, and then, when, once the, the print is dry, I seal it over with acrylic medium and start adding colors by hand with acrylic paint and a brush. Okay, so actually your um, style of painting, what, what I actually really appreciate is when I get up close, I actually like that it, they're not really detailed in where you decide to place the colors. I mean, there's almost a sense of a wash. You're, you're kind of cutting loose there. <laughs> These are not obsessively detailed. Um, and a lot of people think, think that they are when they look at them, and that remains a bit of a mystery to me. In the beginning, I tended to be obsessive, especially when I was using colored pencils, which you can do very fine work with. But I'm, I'm too impatient for that, for one. And then I started doing them faster, and as I, I got into the process deeper, I realized if I really want to learn this, I can't learn it from books, and there's hardly any teachers around. So the best way to teach myself was to get a stack of 100 pictures and say, okay, I'm gonna color these as fast as I can and see what, I, what develops. And one thing that developed was they looked a lot better if I was less obsessive about it. And so in these trees, you can see there's incredible amount of detail possible to worry about in the pine needles, but instead I've taken a, a, a one-inch brush, or a lot of this work is actually done with a two-inch window brush, house painting brush, and just dab the paint on and go boom, 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 like that. And what happens when you step back from it a little bit is somehow your eye pops it together and you don't see that it's all blurry in the color. Uh, which is a, a, a wonderful fact about perception that I don't entirely understand, but it works in my favor because I don't have to spend my whole life going blind like this. I, I mean, it has the essence of an impressionistic painting over a black and white photograph. Is what, that's what I'm putting together. Okay, so now I want to ask you as an artist now, you have... What do you think your role in our community is when one is switching over to being an artist now? What, what contributions, what are we responsible for? That's a terrible question. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> well, what are my responsibilities? Well, I, I think as I have made the move from being a chronicler of the arts in Eugene 
to being a practicing artist, one thing that I've realized is that if I have a responsibility, it is to do the best, most honest work that I can, and to try to put out the best quality work and do that in consultation with other people that I know, people who I trust, and in consultation with myself, if that doesn't sound too mystical, that you, you have to sort of periodically step back and look at what you're doing and say, does this make sense? Right now, I'm, I'm very excited about the work that I do. It has a great pull for me. And so I, I feel like, yes, what, what I'm doing is worthwhile, and I want to see where that goes. Okay, how about any questions? Anybody? There we go. And I'm going to repeat it. Can you explain the frame or the lack thereof? Okay, to, to frame these large pieces for this show would, would not quite bankrupt me, but close. That's reason number one. Reason number two, and this is honest, is I really want people to have access to the paper. I don't mind if you touch this stuff as long as you have reasonably clean hands and you don't yank on it. Um, because it it is a physical object, and I want people to have access to that physicality. So are they sealed then after you paint them? Yes, I, I um, um, varnish the front with acrylic varnish. How about any other questions for Bob? Is the actual painting watercolor? Is the actual painting water? In the broad sense, in the acrylic paint is a water-based paint. Oh. But but it but it is acrylic paint, uh, usually highly thin. How about any other questions? Okay, so we're gonna stay here for about another five ten minutes, and then we are going to be heading. Where are we heading, Jessica? Shadow Fox. To Shadow Fox, and that is seventy six West Broadway. And I'll give you a heads up before we head up. Thank you, Bob. Beautiful work.